Hey guys, welcome back to the Dumont RA103D model Rumson restoration project. When we last left off, we did the first full power up and it seems to work, which is a huge load off my mind. By work, I mean we got a raster and I, I fed a signal in and I was able to get a stable image on the screen. What do we have left? Well, we don't. We haven't checked sound at all. Partly because the owner of this set has been looking forever for the speaker and he can't find it. I bought a parts set that came with this speaker, but it you know, needs a lot of help. So we'll talk about that more in a, in a bit. The relay is currently being bypassed. So next up, we're going to be replacing it with this guy, which looks darn near identical should be a drop-in replacement uh, I want to recheck the tubes reinstall the tube shields uh, power resistors so I temporarily have four of them tacked in below to replace some candle resistors that were open my order of replacements has arrived there should be a bunch of chassis mount resistors I'll have to drill a few mounting holes. Ugh, I hate when they use packing tape on plastic bags. The bag goes in a box. The bag is not going to open and spill out its contents. You don't need to put packing tape on. It just makes it harder for the end user to open the freaking bag. Uh, maybe they're worried about it. the contents spilling out at the warehouse. I don't know. Anyways. I have to drill some holes and use some heat shrink compound and mount these guys. I'm sure you've seen this before and you saw one earlier. They're the gold anodized aluminum little guys. I oversized them all. They're all about double the wattage they should be, but even so, they're tiny. So I think that's actually a 20, that's a 15 watt resistor. Just a little itty bitty guy. I think that's the smallest I used. They're all 15, 20, 25. There's another 15. Whereas the originals are 10, 12, kind of in that, or less, in that realm. It's a, it's a 25 water, and here's a 50 water, and... Oh yeah, there's one through hole resistor. I'm currently using the original on the horizontal output tube. I'm going to replace it with this guy. <laughs> and yeah, I know, not great for the, for the environment, but... Typically when you buy power resistors, especially enamel ones, don't be surprised to see them come like this. There was one resistor in here. I save all this for when I do ship stuff out, so at least it gets reused. But yeah, <laughs> in here we have this. And it's not even an enamel type. The enamel ones, they tend to, they, they can break, but this is not. This is silicone coated, so it's pretty tough stuff. So anyways, we got all that. Got to find an iTube. Uses a 6AL7 iTube. It should be plugged into this. Very few devices use it. It's not. It's not the round one with the pie wedge. It's got uh, two rectangular areas, more like almost like a power meter. I think I've only in my life ever used them in a few Dumont sets, and that is it. But I think I have one or two or three squirreled away somewhere. Uh, picture tube. Yeah, we do have the one that came with this set. I got to retest it. I recall it being a bit weak. Um, but I do have a spare 12 LP4 I could put in there if needed, to, if we need to. I uh, still got a bit of work to do, in other words. Replacement focus coil seems to be working just great, but I will need to cut down the shaft and probably, uh, yeah, file it over to uh, fit this knob on it. This set did not originally have pink and white knobs. This set had been painted when the owner got it. Uh, so we'll just we'll clean them up a bit, but that's if you're wondering why they're pink and white, no, that is not factory. <laughs> so we need to cut that down and file it down so that we can put this knob on it. Back to the speaker. So I gotta check the mounting holes, but I do believe this is what came with the part set, the chassis that I picked up. Uh, doesn't say Dumont on it, but I think this is right. However, obviously the cone is badly damaged and it turns out that the output transformer is shot. The primary is open. 
I dug in there, found the ends, scraped them clean, it's, it's open. However, I do have this guy, which is identical dimensions, and it's an output transformer, primary, uh, secondary on the other side. So we are going to drill out the rivets and mount that. Cone. For now, because I want to make sure the speaker works, I'm going to patch it up enough that it can work. It's, I'm going to glue up around the edge so it's more stable, and we'll just leave this section open. I just want to see what this transformer and this speaker will it vibrate and make some sound. And I do have new cones on the way. A uh, viewer sent me a link to a fantastic seller on eBay that has tons of speaker reconing stuff and a big supply of vintage paper cones in all the sizes, all the popular sizes. This is a six inch. She had half a dozen different flavors to choose from. I chose the one that seemed to have exactly the same ribbing where there were three and then a gap and then three more and a little gap before the voice coil. So, so yeah, there's six inches in diameter, but the other thing you gotta be concerned about is what is the angle? Like how deep does it go? Will it meet the voice coil at the right space? So <laughs> we'll see how that goes. I'm not an expert at reconing, but we'll give it a shot. I think it'd be a little more stable if I do it like this. Who knows? Oh, actually, <laughs> as I say that, well, that, that's not a little hair coming out. That That is a part of the winding, so, yeah. Well, it ain't pretty, but it should be good enough for a basic test. So I clipped the primary from the speaker to the output of the set, and the secondary to the voice coil on the speaker. I have glued up the cone, so even though it's missing a section, it is actually fairly stable and it moves. So let's uh, put this in FM radio mode, turn it on, and let's see if we can get some FM radio reception. Also, I want to point out something about this dial. When you're down here, that's TV, that's TV in between is FM radio. Well, there's a cam system behind this with all these gears. And see this piece of metal here? It's irregularly shaped. When you're down here, you have to turn this a lot up to go between stations. But when you get towards the FM, suddenly a little turn on this moves this needle quite a bit. Otherwise, it'd be very painful to tune in FM stations. That's a good sign. This is a rather dirty volume control. Alright, so we should get something around channel 6, so this, this dial's off, so I'm not quite sure where it's going to kick in. So, the lowest around here is, is 87.7 MeTV FM, it's basically where channel 6 is on the dial, so I think that's probably what I just heard, so yeah, this, this needle, I already noticed that earlier, needs to be moved. I'm not quite sure how you do that. You can't force it really. This, all these gears are rather tightly meshed. Maybe there's a trimmer cap we can adjust or something. These days, everything in Chicago land costs more. Nice. And I have basically no antenna, just some alligator clips up back there. <laughs> yeah. Speaker's not, not too happy about a section of it being missing, the edges of it are rattling around, but the low volume level, that shouldn't sound too bad. It's another huge load off my mind. And yeah, there is no reception here. The FM band is more like over here, so 
more confirmation that we are way off because there should be tons of stations over in here. And it's it started getting really slow when I got over here. I gotta turn and turn and turn to get a little needle. Let's see where this thing actually bottoms out. It should get all the way down here. Actually, it does. It does. Curious. Oh, I see. I just simply went from 108 right to 7, but there's another band which probably aren't used today anymore. Aviation Amateur Telephone. So there's just going to be a dead zone on this these days, I imagine. And then the FM kicks in right about where it should, so... Yeah, I think this mechanism is fine. It's, uh... The local oscillator has to be adjusted. Let's see, so right now it's moving fast. Starts moving slow right about where it should, so... Okay, we just got to shift the whole local oscillator over. <laughs> All right, fantastic. So let's move on. That speaker cone will arrive here uh, hopefully in the next couple days and we can recone that. Let's put that aside and get back to the rest of the set. Check this out. That looks a little bit better, doesn't it? So, I went through and double checked the tubes and I found the 6AG7. Kind of an oddball. I believe I've ever seen a set with a 6AG7 video amp tube before, but the one that was in there was quite weak, so I replaced it. Boy, that sucker gets hot. Uh, and this is definitely the culprit why the horizontal hold was going so wonky. And uh, this is the one that was in there, and it tests good, it looks real nice, but we put it in there, and the horizontal hold is just garbage. Put all the shields back on, and oh, another big difference is I fixed the, uh, the input back here. The, uh, the broken off ground lead, and I got my adapter, so no more alligator clips or anything. Uh, I replaced a couple of 6AG5s with some new old stock ones, and yeah, boy, we got a razor sharp picture now. Can't wait to see this with some actual live video. Oh, yeah, and then there's this guy. What the heck does this do? I don't know if I turn it fully counterclockwise, it makes the picture look better, and if I go fully clockwise, not so much. I'm sure that uh, is the AGC. Let's take a gander at the schematic. Well, I'm feeling a little bit foolish right now and maybe a little relieved. I completely forgot about this set. I picked it up in the spring at the early television convention from another collector, primarily for the cabinet. Because I have another one of these I like got years ago and the veneer, somebody used a belt sander on it and just annihilated it. But, if it looks familiar to you, yeah. It, no, it's not a Dumont, but what's inside of it is a Dumont chassis. The same one is the one that I'm working on. And this does has a, have that eye tube that I've been scrambling to find. I don't know if it's good or not, but we can find out. And this should have the speaker I need. Which means, I didn't need to replace an output transformer. I don't need to recone it. I could probably just use this speaker. And even if none of this pans out, <laughs> I have another one of these in storage that I could get stuff out of. And I also have a Crosley 9407 I got many, many, many years ago, which is also a clone of this and should also have the speaker in the iTube in it. I'd have to travel out to the Burbs and go to my storage space to, to find that out. But meanwhile, we have this right here now. It is a... Uh, looks like a homemade back on it. We gotta take the back off and uh, check. I've, I've, I have not looked at this set since the day I brought it home, so I really don't remember what the situation is inside. But let's find out. Okay, I plucked the i tube out. Six AL seven. The speaker, though, no, that is not most definitely not the original speaker. Looks like the output original output transformer was mounted from the speaker frame, bolted to the cabinet, and that's a modern permanent magnet speaker in there. So. That's a wash, but at least we got this, and I know I can go to my storage locker and get the other stuff if I need to, but for now we'll proceed with the speaker repairs as planned. 
All right, let's give this a try. Don't expect too much. It's definitely a gimmicky thing. Oh, yeah, it's coming up. Oh, when you kill the lights, it kills the... Uh... <laughs> That's cute. It kills the eye tube too. Well, it's actually good because that means it's going to save the eye tube from wear and tear. Because they do, uh, they do burn out. So why do I say it's gimmicky? Well, this this type of eye tube in particular, uh, I think only one side of it moves when you're tuning a channel. Yeah, just the right side. The left side never does anything. And the right side, it's split in half, only the top half. So only the top half of one side does anything. And that's about all it does. Just a very tiny level indicator. But you know what? It's a really good indicator too if you're tuned in or not. Just look at the screen. <laughs> okay, there we are not tuned in. There we are tuned in. But I know people like their eye tubes, so... Um, as far as how good it is, it's okay. I mean, they're not super bright under the best of circumstances, not this particular type. Uh, and it's a very small target area. I think um, my Stromberg Carlson TS-16 on the other side of the room might have one. We can try that one. Otherwise, I did order one up. Um, and the, the seller showed an image of it lit up and it seemed to be pretty bright so uh, we can try that one too when it arrives but just wanted you to see what it does now as for that that is sensitivity control and they do outline what it's for it's for if you replace the pitcher tube Dumont being Dumont top of the line everything's got to be super precise and accurate it's so you can fine tune your set because there are going to be slight manufacturing variations even if you use exactly the correct replacement pitcher tube so we chose to turn the contrast fully counterclockwise just to brightness until dc voltmeter connected between brightness control arm and chassis reads 45 volts and then adjust the pitcher sensitivity control until a raster just appears on the screen so in other words it helps you adjust the relative response between the cathode, the grid, and the first accelerating anode. I suspect it doesn't make a huge difference, but uh, once we get our proper pitcher tube installed, we can play around with it. Man, I'll tell you, the fun just never ends with this set. Finally replace the two caps inside of this. Install the relay, I'll show you how that works in a minute, it's kind of neat. But there are some other issues. One, um, I know it's a while ago, but I don't think I ever mentioned it. The flyback is floppy. Yeah, floppy flyback. It's not secure at the bottom. There should be two screws at the top, two at the bottom. And when I peer down at the bottom, the holes don't line up. And my initial thought was, oh, it's a replacement because there's so many other modifications on this set. I figured this was just another one. Um,. But no, on closer inspection, what's happened is, yeah, the two screws are missing from down below, but the core has slipped in the frame. So this needs to be pushed up. There we go. <laughs> now the holes probably line up. But I don't know if I can get the screws in from the other side because all this stuff's in the way. The screws go down below this, but at least... At least we have a chance now. It makes some sense. There's a much more troubling issue on the other side of the set. Alright, so down on each one of these coils is a little contact that slides back and forth as I rotate this. Hope you guys can see that. I'll try to get a little more light down in there. It's hard to see. And that doesn't help with the situation, but right now it's two turns over from the right. And all three coils are in exactly the same position. But that's as low as it'll go. Right there. We've still got another about turn and a half, two turns more, it could go to the right. When you go to the other extreme of the dial, it goes almost all the way to the very end. It's like the whole thing needs to be shifted over one loop on one, on one turn on those coils. I don't know how to make that happen. <sighs> At first I thought, well, I can loosen up maybe one end of the shaft 
and pop it up and slide them over but this is <laughs> this is a complicated me mechanism it's in there pretty securely I thought maybe I could loosen this nut and free up the center of the shaft lift it up slide the contacts over and it didn't work so what does make it stop it's this mechanism here there's a piece of metal that smacks into that and that's when you're done and these other little pieces here it's like there's one little a uh, piece of metal here for each kind of turn on that coil and as you rotate these those you move along move around I've never quite seen a mechanism like this in anything else but so when you go this way they, they kind of spread all over but eventually they catch up to each other and they start bumping into each other until they all smack together and then you're done and then something similar when you go the other way I don't see any means, there's no Allen wrench or anything, you know, like screw that you'd loosen up and sh uh, shift the shaft over or anything like that. Changing the pointer is not going to do you any good, it's like we need to physically be able to move <laughs> the shaft around further than it's going. So, if anybody knows how to do that, uh, let me know, otherwise, uh, I think there is a Mallory induct tuner, like, manual just on this module available online, um, and I know other Restorers have had to do repairs on these, so somebody might have a suggestion. Otherwise, everything's moving forward very smoothly. I'll show you the relay now. All right, there is the relay. I'm going to turn the set on. You'll hear the control click. Watch that. It'll take a few seconds. So, set's on. In there, I clicked over. Very exciting, right? <laughs> and I'll turn the set off, and it really closes. So, what does that do? Well, check out the current draw for one. So, now the set's warmed up, so it's going to click on fairly quickly. But turn it on. See the current jumps way up when the relay clicks in. What's doing is it's it's not, it's, it's, that goes right after the rectifiers, so there is no positive voltage going anywhere in the set until that relay clicks in, and the relay doesn't click in until the tubes have warmed up. The end effect on the screen is kind of neat. I'll show it to you later when I got the set connected up to a single source and stuff, but what it does is other sets, when you turn them on, the screen will slowly fade in, it'll take a while to synchronize. This delays power until everything is warmed up so when the relay clicks the you get a good picture it snaps in almost instantly full brilliance and locked in and everything so kind of a neat thing but obviously when this sets really cold <laughs> you gotta wait a good 10 15 20 seconds before it clicks in but hey it's there it works hooray all right man it's not easy to take the crt out and one of the tubes here are where those Missing screws go, so I just got one in here. And I can thread my way between these new caps, I think, and get that last one. <laughs> it's not going to be easy. Uh, I can't imagine if the full size electrolytics were installed, there's no way you could do it. And if you're thinking, oh, I'll just take this off, this is spot welded to this whole thing. You would have to take this entire assembly apart to get down at those. So, geez. <laughs> It makes me wonder, did it ship like this? I mean, like how how were those taken out when they were when those filter caps were in place? Like, what what happened to the set? I suppose we'll never know. Alrighty, fly back. Secure, new high voltage lead, new anode cap, or new old an old cap and then there's the high voltage cage I don't know what the heck happened here but uh, I'm gonna take it out to the bench vise in the garage and see if we can uh, straighten that out a bit and then it will go on like so so 
what's left? Well, to sort that out, I have a few uh, chassis mount power resistors to install down below and full size CRT. I got a really, a really nice Sylvania test like new and I've got this nice adhesive back rubber compound we're going to put in here and all around the loop band that uh, holds it secure. <sighs> I think the last thing, major thing, is to cut off the shaft and prepare it to take this knob. I hope you're getting some sense of what it takes to work on a set like this. You always hear about recap and gotta replace the caps. Sure, that's easy. You can do that in one evening. Snip out a bunch of paper caps, J hook some new ones in, or clean off the terminal, whatever. It's very, very straightforward. It's all this stuff that is time consuming, takes experience, can be tricky, can be hard to find parts for, that will drive you nuts. Oh, hang on. I think I know why this got all mangled. I was wondering what the heck this was. When I was working on the set, I noticed this. And then there's that. There must have been a chain connecting these two. Just like uh, you see in uh, some Philco sets. So when you take the high voltage cage cover off, it's still attached to the chassis, I guess, so you don't lose it. I've seen these very often cut off or torn off because they drive service techs crazy. There must have been one here. And that's what happened. 